joining us today. Um, we're going to be learning about Molly of Denali and how to integrate Molly of Denali into um, your curriculum, whether you're teaching our early childhood program or our school program. Molly of Denali is for Denali is for kids from uh, four to eight years old. Um, so this particular webinar is a little bit focused um, or geared towards, or it's a webinar for instructors, but if you're a parent, you're more than welcome to be here and you can also learn how to help your child um, learn with Molly as well. So if you need any closed captioning, there's a link um, in the chat. So feel free to use that. It'll pop up on a separate page. Um, everyone's going to be muted for right now. We'll have questions towards the end. So just hold on to those questions if you have them. Um, and if you want to say hi, you can say hi in the chat, put your name in. So if you're a Techos Home instructor, feel free to put your name and what organization you work for. If you're a parent, just go ahead and put your name in. Um, we'd love to just see your names and faces. That's great. Okay, so um, um, if just in case you're a little bit new to Zoom, um, you should be seeing my screen and then you should be seeing some faces for the cameras that are on up at the top. Um, if you want to share or stop sharing your video, there's a button down at the bottom left and there's a chat button towards the center here that you can click in order to um, type in if you want to communicate with us. So, um, as I said, the Molly of Denali webinar today is geared towards preparing techos home instructors uh, to incorporate the Molly of Denali video content and digital games and informational text into their curriculum. So we're also going to go over what informational text is so that all of that makes sense. Um, here with me today are two people from GBH, formerly known as W. WBGH, who are content experts and have created Molly of Denali. Um, so before we start, I'm going to have them introduce themselves as well. So I'm going to call up Gay. She can introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Gay Morbacher. I've been with GBH for a couple decades now. Um, and I do outreach work uh, in the educational community. So a lot of presentations like this, introducing folks to our work and um, resources they can share for free with families. And my colleague, Melissa Carlson, is here. Hi, um, I'm Melissa Carlson. I'm a senior digital producer at GBH. Um, I've been uh, working on kids' games and apps and in the education space for about 10 years. And I've been working on Molly for the last several, um, producing the app you'll see today, our games and our website. And um, just really from all the projects that I've worked on, I really feel so honored to work on Molly. It's this project that really brings native Alaskans to the screen in this authentic and contemporary way. And it's been really um, a great experience as a digital producer to get to extend that learning into um, another space sort of beyond the TV show that you'll see today. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over now to um, Natalie to say hello. Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Petit and I am the program coordinator at Tech Goes Home. And today I'm just helping and um, answering any questions in the chat. And that's basically all. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Natalie. Um, okay, so what we're going to go over today, uh, we've done our introductions. Um, we're going to give you an overview of the Molly of Denali initiative. Um, and then we're going to go into the Molly of Denali curriculum. Gay is going to just give you sort of an overview of um, how it works, the Alaska Native values, and also what informational texts are and how to use them. Um, and I'll go into more detail after her later. Um, Melissa is going to present the Molly of Denali learning app, um, which is highly accessible and um, you can get it on pretty much every device. Um, and then after that, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about incorporating informational texts, um, both in the classroom and at home. And I'm going to introduce you to the museum planner, which is basically uh, a whole like lesson planner curriculum uh, project that you can do with your kids at school or at home. And then what we'll do, that'll probably be about an hour's worth or so. Um, and after that, we'll do a, a Q&A. So if you have questions, just write them down. Um, and then when we get to the Q&A, we're happy to stay on for about a half hour or so if needed to answer all your questions about any of the things we talked about. Um, so just expect that to happen. 
Um, I hope all of you had a chance to watch uh, the video called Grandpa's Drum. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if you were able to watch that? Some of you were great. It looks like most of you are great. Um, if you didn't get to watch it, you can definitely watch it after the webinar. It's just one episode. And um, I think this is a beautiful episode that really um, showcases Molly, her, her neighborhood, uh, both her use of technology, informational text, and some of the Alaskan values as well. So um, I just wanted to make sure everybody, if you were able to watch it, just to get a feel for Molly and the cartoon itself. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'll just stay right now that I was not part of creating Molly O'Donnelly like Gay and Melissa were, but it's really one of my favorite um, cartoons now, and I, um, I actually really enjoy watching it. Okay, so I'm going to share a video, and let me see if I, I hope I have my settings correct. Can you guys hear that? Yeah, okay, perfect. Hey everyone, it's me, Molly. Molly hey there, it's Molly and Tui and Trini. Hi. <laughs> hey. Molly of Denali is about a ten-year-old Alaska Native girl, Molly Mabray. Yes. Who lives in a trading post with her family near Denali. Denali Trading Post. And it's really about her daily life, playing with her dog Suki and her friends and having adventures. Whoa. Is that where we're going, Nina? Yep. Best trip ever! I think it's important for kids to meet Molly because she's adventurous, she's smart, and she's kind. Surprise! Molly. I've always wanted to do a kid show that was set in a store. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was a store located in Alaska? Your backyard could be the great outdoors. Hi. Wow, it looks so wild. <gasps> I see caribou! I grew up all over the state of Alaska. I'm a Netsaigwichan person. And growing up, I never saw people that looked like me on television. So when I saw that the production was looking for a creative producer, I was like, this is a dream come true for me. Do kids in Alaska still sing traditional songs? I just saw this major opportunity to get things right. It's important for kids to see themselves reflected on screen. Because if you can see it, you can be it. Hey everyone, so if you've been wondering, how big is Molly's Village? I'll tell you. Kaya has a population of 94. Hi, howdy. Hey kids. Aunt Myrna, hello. Can I help you? Not counting Moose and Caribou. I'm really excited about our cast and the characters in Molly of Denali because it's very diverse and that's a reflection of America. Even in our small rural communities in Alaska, there's diversity. We need to see a true representation of what our country looks like. The salmon are running. Why do they say that salmon run? That's a great question. And if you could find the answer, I'll take you fishing. I'm on it. Does salmon run meat? The curriculum is something called informational text, which is really about helping kids understand that information is everywhere. They just need the tools and the knowledge to access it. You know what we need? The internet! It's all right there on PBS. The games, apps, television, resources. Everything they need to prepare themselves to be ready for school. From Kaya, Alaska, this is Molly signing off. I hope that kids really come away excited and empowered to learn that they can unlock information that can help them answer questions and solve problems. Did you know a single mosquito can lay 300 eggs at a time? I hope that children see that we have relationships not only with each other, but the land and the animals. Thank you, Goyanapak, to this river for bringing us life. We respect you and ask that you give us safe travels. We have these cultural values of taking care of one another, of deep-seated listening and respect. And so I'm really excited about sharing those values with the world. 
Sassy Joe, and see you next time. Great. Um, so I just thought that was um, really fun to show you. Just once is plenty. <laughs> there you go. Just to show you um, a little bit more about um, the creation of Molly and some of the background. So I'm going to hand it off to Gay now. Just give us a second while we switch screens. <laughs> Working on it, guys. <laughs> no problem. Seamless, utterly seamless. Okay, so of course, Molly of Denali is a show on PBS Kids. And families will not only enjoy the TV show, but Molly has a podcast on the website. The website itself is a place where you can watch episodes and um, access the, uh, the learning games. Um, the sweet spot, as we said before, uh, is children ages four to eight. Locally, you can find Molly on uh, TV's channel two, or you can watch episodes on the website, as I said, or on YouTube. And one last option for families is to download the free PBS Kids video app, and you can watch full episodes of Molly there, as well as full episodes of other PBS Kids shows. Again, that's a free app in English. And my slides don't want to advance. So thank you. Um, the series has two key goals. The first of which is to share with kids and grown-ups an authentic portrayal of Alaska Native culture and values like these. In a diverse city like Boston, I think you'll agree it's important to understand others' cultures and connect to and compare to our own values. Um, Alaska Native values are good ones for us all to live by. Theirs is a culture of connection with and respect for families, communities, the land, and its animals. Naming, discussing, and comparing cultural values is important to kids' social emotional learning. So as you decide to use Molly of Denali in your Techco's home courses, you can refer to this PDF, and I believe Nessie's already given you access to it, with useful guidelines about incorporating Alaska Native content. The series other goal is to model real life use of what is called informational text or IT. Um, educators, educators use the term informational text broadly. Um, it comes in different forms, but its purpose is to convey information information that satisfies our curiosity, information that takes advantage of opportunities, teaches others, accomplishes tasks, or solves real world problems. And we access informational text by reading it, seeing it, or hearing it. So it may be a definition we read in a printed or a digital dictionary. It could be what the veterinarian tells us about caring for our cat, or maybe it's a YouTube video we watch to learn how to cut up uh, a pineapple. Informational texts help us follow our interests and solve our problems. Molly and her friends engage with different kinds of IT in the course of each episode. And research suggests young children best learn about IT in real world contexts. So the series uses events in Molly's daily life to create authentic learning about the use of informational texts. And specifically, these are the five types of IT that kids will see in the Molly Denali series. So informative text that explains the world. So Molly might find that kind of IT in a social studies book or a world atlas or even a wildlife poster. How to information like a recipe for making blueberry jam 
or the directions for playing a board game or the steps involved in giving CPR. Biographical profiles of real people are also considered informational text. Narratives that give you a true story from history. And finally, functional texts are informational text. So things like a bus schedule or a what to pack list, even a do not enter sign. These are all examples of informational text. So you can see it's an integral part of daily life and in, informational text is certainly a big part of school. So students have to be able to access it, absorb it, and even create their own informational text. So there is a PDF that we've created and Nessie shared with you where you can reference what is and isn't informational text and how to incorporate it into your teaching. So that was kind of a thousand foot flyover. I'm sure you guys are gonna have questions that we'll be happy to answer. And now my colleague uh, from GBH, Melissa, will walk you through the Molly Learning app. And believe it or not, it takes advantage of both Alaska Native values and informational text. Sheer genius. So Melissa, time to share your screen. Um, and I'll just jump in while she's switching, well, while we're switching screens here. So um, all the files that we're talking about today, um, I put them on the webinar page on our website. So it'll be there and the recording will be there as well. Um, and after the webinar, we'll be sending out an email as well, just to, you know, with the link to them as well. So um, you can download them uh, off our website or from that email that we'll send you and you can look at those PDFs and, and things. There's a couple more um, that I'm gonna show you as well. So you'll have access to all the materials. All right, can folks see my screen? Yes. Okay, great, two tries, there we go. Um, Excellent. I'm so happy to talk with everyone today. So I, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Molly Learning app, how you can get it, what's in it, um, and how you can use it um, in your trainings with folks you work with. So first off, the app is free, um, so anyone can get it. It's really widely available. You can get it from pretty much all of the app stores. Um, and it works, as Nessie said, on a wide range of devices, um, including um, a lot of older and lower powered devices um, that our audience often uses. Um, so that makes it accessible to a wide range of folks. Um, you can also find the app on our website, which is really great if you're um, working in Chromebooks. The app is English language. Um, we've got some Alaska Native phrases included throughout. And uh, it's also, I think as Nessie said, very accessible. We've got closed captions on screen throughout the experience. Um, and so because of that, it, it works well for emerging readers, for kids who are you know, still learning to read, because Molly herself will read aloud all of the text that's on screen as a helpful aid to the player. So I am going to... Um, hopefully do just show you a very short uh, little promotional trailer um, to give you a little flavor for the app. Just a moment. So yeah, just a very short little, short little, little, uh, little taste. You can see some of the gameplay there. Um, so the 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 Molly app. Um, I'll give you a longer tour now, to sort of walk you through those that little fly through that you saw in more detail. So the app includes six big games, and um, all of them are embedded in a virtual version of Molly's Village in Alaska. So we have these individual game experience, and then we have this sort of exploratory. 
um, village immersion experience where you can um, sort of explore more of the Alaska Native experience as well. So we really designed the app to capture the essence of Molly and what you've seen in the, in the show and the episodes you've watched. So we've got lots of adventure. We're reflecting those Alaska Native values and traditions. And then we really have our players use the informational text curriculum to help them solve real world problems, just like Molly does in the show. So really the centerpiece, the core feature of this app is this immersive interactive world um, where players get to explore the village, um, you meet members of her community, um, you find the different games hidden in the village, um, and then you play these little small activities that are embedded throughout. You, um, you get to walk around the village as Molly, um, like you saw in the trailer. You meet people, this is her dad here, um, and then you get these little um, missions to complete. And a lot of the missions focus on items like blueberries or salmon that you might win or gather while you play. And then you can give them to people in the village. Um, like in this example here, you're picking blueberries so that dad can make jam. And a lot of these small interactions like this one, they'll focus on the Alaska Native values, um, like honoring your elders, uh, sharing what you have, uh, respect for the land and nature, um, as like the producers talked about in the clip we watched. Um, so, you know, in this example, in this interactive, uh, Molly thanks the berries as she's picking them and the player can only pick what they need. And then there's lots of other things to do in Molly's village too, like traditional drumming with Grandpa Nat, snowball fights with her friends. Um, this image on the bottom here is collecting birch tree sap so that Molly's aunt can make syrup. Um, so lots of little things to explore. Um, and then we have our bigger games and the games are really where we dive into the informational text part of the curriculum that Gay talked about. So, um, so now I'll take a closer look at those six games with you all. So this first one, um, this game was a first for PBS, um, going fishing. Like nobody had done a fishing game before, go figure. Um, so for, for, for Molly and her community, salmon fishing is really important. Um, it's core to Alaska Native culture. And so we modeled our game on contemporary subsistence living. So players will fish for salmon using a rod and reel. Um, and then this um, device, this sort of Y-shaped um, contraption on the other side called a fish wheel. And Alaska natives, they always catch fish for a purpose to feed their family, their friends, um, their sled dogs maybe. And so in our game, we're careful to model the same thing. So we give kids these fun ways to play and fish, um, but we also want them to respect nature and we don't let them overfish. And so those values and sort of the patience required in fishing make this sort of a unique, a unique game. And of course, informational text has to be part of the mix too. So um, to, help, to help the player fish, you're gonna use um, a reference book where you can learn about all different aspects of Alaskan fishing, like what's the best hook to use um, or how you find the best spot on the river. And you do this by um, the player reads uh, captions and they interpret diagrams that we give them. Um, and then also you can see in the, the pages of the book there, a couple of the supports that we offer for emerging readers. Um, we've got, we highlight the text as it's read aloud to sort of help kids um, who are learning to read follow along. Um, and Molly sort of acts as a guide, that little button sort of follows along the text. And then if you tap her, she'll reread everything back to you. So there's a lot of opportunities um, if you're an emerging reader to kind of practice and listen and read along which is unusual, I think, in a game, a game space. Um, so uh, another kind of animal for our second game, dog sleds, uh, dogs and sled dogs. Um, so you're gonna go on this game, you're gonna go on a dog sledding adventure, you're gonna deliver um, items to Molly's grandpa out in the field. So like the fishing game, this one gets players out in nature, you're traveling through the Alaskan wilderness um, in a very traditional way, like you were in a canoe in the last one, you're in a dog sled here. 
and you get to pick from some really, really cute sled dogs, um, the same ones you see in the show, um, and you drive your sled dog team, you're avoiding obstacles, grabbing treats, so we've got a lot of like fun um, gaminess um, embedded in this one. Um, and then here also on the screen, you can see at the bottom one of the examples of how we like incorporated some of the Alaska Native language into the games. So after you finish a round, um, you, it writes in the snow, Gwinzi, which means um, like, that's awesome in, uh, in Gwich'in. So just like little ways that we worked in some of the, some of the native language. And so looking at the informational text part of this, um, for this game, players use an app to find the information they need to care for the sled dogs and to navigate their way to grandpa. Um, they get to feed the dogs, dress them, all kinds of fun things you would like to do with adorable dogs. Um, and, you know, we chose um, to have them use an app in this game so that we could model sort of a digital informational text experience for kids in contrast to that physical book um, that we saw them use in the fishing game, because it's important to sort of expose them to all those different places where informational text can show up. And so for this next game, um, for all the creative types out there, um, this one focuses on the tradition of Alaska Native beadwork. So players make beaded designs by following instructions on cards that have been passed down by Molly's family. So we, um, you can sort of follow the instructions and then we also give players sort of a free play space where they can get creative and make their own beaded designs in, a, in a, this free play mode. So um, in order to, to, to do the beading, they've got to gather up all their materials um, and then you stitch these intricate designs um, using like a tap mechanic that mim mimics uh, needle and thread. And there's a bunch of different things you can make. There's this butterfly, that's Molly's dog Suki. We've got some local Alaska flower patterns in there. Um, and we created all of these beaded patterns with the help of one of our um, Alaska Native advisors, who's like an amazing bead, beadwork artist. Um, so once you've made your beaded design, you can put them on little objects like a hat or a bag, and then you can gift them um, to Molly's friends back in the village to sort of create a little um, connection between the game and the village experience. Um, and so, you know, for this game, the informational text is the instruction piece, and then learning from elders in the form of those beading cards, and then sharing what you've learned with somebody else are sort of the, the ways that we've incorporated these Alaska Native values into, into this game. So next up um, is the Denali Trading Post. So you, you saw that in the video. Um, the Trading Post, it's really central part of Molly's world. It's the community store and it's also her home. So it felt important to have a game that's sort of centered around that experience. So this one, you get to step into Molly's shoes and help her run the store. Um, you get to interact with customers, you fill orders, and you make sure that everything is running smoothly. And this game in particular, we designed for um, the younger end of our audience, um, more around like the four-year-olds, it's a little bit simpler. Um, our other games we really built and tested um, for five to six-year-olds. So obviously, you know, there's a wide range of experiences from kids and um, they can get enjoyment out of it on either end of the age range. But this one, we particularly aged down a little bit younger. So we know there's younger kids who watch Molly and we wanted to have something sort of just for them. So the game gives kids two ways to play. Um, Molly collects items that customers want from the stock room. And then you can also help her clean up by putting things back in the right spot. Um, and as you can see, you get to see some of the cool like outdoorsy gear that the trading post carries. Um, and you also get to meet more of the community members when they come into shop. So that's a nice little community, community feel. Um, oh yeah, and you also, of course, get to play with Molly's dog, Suki, because, you know, why not? And then um, we recently, just this summer, added two more games to the app, which we're really excited about. Um, this first one um, was inspired by how much sunlight um, Alaska has in the summer. So that really made us think about creating a gardening game where you were growing giant vegetables because that just felt really fun and exciting. So you're growing vegetables for the state fair and you need to choose the right informational text 
to um, get the information you need. So you choose, we give you three different books or blogs or seed packets, and you've got to see which one is the right one for the job. And then you use gardening tools to water your plants and keep them safe and grow those like enormous squashes, which is very fun. And then um, this is the last game that I will show from the app. Um, in this one, players get to be scientists as they explore the Alaskan wilderness with Molly. They get to find lots of amazing animals and they can take photos of them and sketch them in their notebook. And this game um, is the one that we've made that gives kids the opportunity to make their own informational text. Um, they use those photos and those drawings they've made to complete captions and diagrams in their field journal. So it really kind of takes some of what we've done in the other games, then gives kids a little agency to sort of make their own experience. Um, we think it's, it's pretty fun. Um, so that is, um, that is in a nutshell, that's the app. Thank you for listening. I hope you're really excited to, you know, download it and play with it. And we think all of these different, you know, I showed you a lot here. There's, you know, six games in the, you know, the village, but, um, you know, we think having so many different ways to play can give you opportunities to engage and appeal to all different kinds of learners that you might, you know, that families might have. Um, so hopefully it gives you like a lot of options to, to pull from um, when you're working with families. And I'll pass it back now to Nessie. Great. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah? Thumbs up if you can see my screen. Awesome. Okay. Um, so let me press present. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about informational text. So, um, you know, I want to make sure that everybody, by the time you leave, you kind of understand what they are, you know, how to use them, how to encourage um, children to use them as well. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, both as, you know, how it relates to Molly and, and how to incorporate or use them in, in other situations as well. So um, if informational text, again, like as Gay said, it really can be anything that gives you information, right? It can be a book, it can be an app, it can be the instructions on the back of the seed packet, it can be a cooking recipe, right? Anything that's informational. Um, they are usually something that either just educates us or helps us solve a problem, right? So we're trying to get that information. Um, for young children, uh, listening to and reading and writing and illustrating informational text is a great way to build knowledge and vocabulary um, in science, social studies, um, and the arts. Um, and I just want to emphasize the fact that it doesn't just say reading informational text and it doesn't just say, um, you know, listening or writing, but also creating them as well. So it's good for them to, um, you know, if they're learning something to create informational text themselves as well. Um, and you can actually incorporate informational text into almost any activity at home or at school. So um, I think someone mentioned that earlier too, that um, it's all around us, right? So they're, they're really everywhere. Okay, so some suggestions for families. So if you're a, a parent or a grandparent here, these are some suggestions for you as well. If you're a teacher, you can share these with parents as well. So find out what your child's interests are, right? Like if they're interested in something, um, find a way for them to use informational text to learn more about that, right? Are they really into dinosaurs? I have seen like the coolest ever dinosaur books. Um, but also there's, you know, those apps and, and different kinds of things as well, right? So if whether they're into animals or they're into other kind of things, think about what they're interested in and help them teach them how to find reliable informational text all around them about those things. Um, also creating recipes um, is a really great way um, to do that as well. So if you're at home cooking anyway, um, you can always have them sort of write down. I don't know about um, you guys. My mom didn't cook very much, uh, but my grandfather did. And I like to watch him cooking and things like that. So um, especially while we're home with our kids, if you're cooking, while you're cooking, you can keep them entertained by having them create a recipe while you're cooking, right? Like, okay, now we need the tomatoes and you got to write down, you know, 
dice the tomatoes or, you know, make a drawing of all the ingredients that go in. If they're not quite at writing level, that's fine too. Um, but just trying to find your everyday activities and incorporate into that finding information and creating informational text as well. Um, something, for example, like if you're out and about and you do have to run some errands, like teaching your kid how to read a map, right? Or having them create a map before or after um, your activity or your outing as well. Um, and of course, just a shameless plug here, like watching Molly of Denali, I think what's really great about it is that she really models in every single episode how to find information, right? Whenever she's got a question, she's a very curious girl. She always goes to find the answers, right? She knows to go to the library and look for things, go ask um, an older person to see if they have resources, go on the internet. So it's a lot of really good modeling in the show. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to the Molly and Me Museum Planner. Um, so the Museum Planner is really great because it's basically a complete lesson plan. Um, so you can use this if you're an instructor, you can use this in your course. Um, it's already made for you and it's really easy because you just kind of follow it. And if you're a parent or grandparent, this is also something that you can do at home um, and guide your kids uh, through it as well. So the Museum Planner is a set of activities um, that encourages people, uh, children to use and then create informational text. It's basically, in a nutshell, Molly makes a museum of uh, like a few little exhibits of her culture. And I'm going to show it to you in a little bit. Like, this is about this person who lives here. This is about the animals in my city. This is about, you know, a tradition that we have. So she makes a little museum. It's like five little stations, I think. Um, and the museum planner also asks, the students or your kids, your, your students, your kids, um, to also create a museum, a uh, set of museum exhibits to share their life, their community, their stuff as well. So you're learning about Molly and also sharing about your own cultures. I think um, this is a great way to have kids learn about their own families, their own homes, their own communities. And also in a school setting, um, it's really great because they can share and learn about each other's backgrounds and each other's communities. Um, so I'm going to show it to you in general. Here's the table of contents. Um, just what I want to kind of point out here is the first um, activity is talking about values. So it introduces them to Alaskan Native values, but also asks them what their values are. Um, then it kind of introduces museum placards, which are, you know, on the, in the museum, the, the little card that gives you information about thing, the thing that you're looking at. Um, introduces them to idea of a bio sketch, and we'll get into that into, in a minute. Um, they're using a map, and they're also thinking about traditions. So there's a lot of different uh, types of activities here. Um, so again, the museum um, planner is based, this one particularly, of course, it's Molly themed, so it's based on Alaskan Native values, but it also encourages children to um, explore their own cultures and, and communities and families and their own values as well, and encourages researching and creating informational text. Um, the thing I also want you to pay attention to here is that all of these activities can be done digitally, but they can also be hands-on projects, right? So I'm a big fan of kind of mixing digital stuff and hands-on projects. Technology is great. I work for a company, we're trying to spread technology and that's great, but we don't wanna lose the like tactile learning, right? So we wanna make sure that kids are learning to have healthy digital habits and also learn that they shouldn't necessarily be in front of a screen 24 hours a day either, right? So you can jump from doing some activity online to then doing a hands-on project with like, you know, things you have around the house, clay, drawing, things like that. So you'll see that you have the option to do both. All right, so let me switch um, here to the museum planner. Um, full screen mode. Um, so here's the museum planner. Um, so there's a couple different pages. Um, if we were in person, I could hand some out for you. They're kind of, um, this booklet is actually kind of like a calendar where you flip the pages up, but you can definitely just print these out. And you can also just look at them on the screen. If you don't have a printer, you can look at them on the screen and kids can work sort of offline with them as well. Um, so here's that table of contents again. And I'll just walk you through some of this. Um, so this here's an introduction to Molly. Of course, if they've been watching the show, uh, probably a good place to start is let them watch a couple episodes so they get the feel for her. But this definitely explains uh, 
the, the activity and a little bit of Molly. So here she talks about, um, you know, a museum, visiting the museum, and also she talks about what an artifact is, right? So she says an artifact is an item made by humans that has a special meaning. So the entire project is you're making artifacts, and those are the things that um, share that information. So here again is that same list that Gay showed you earlier of Alaskan Native values, and I think these are also just great to go over as an activity. Um, and, you know, have kids pick out which ones they think are their favorite or their most important or which ones they think, oh, my family has that value too, right? So they can connect a little bit to the Alaskan values. Um, and then you talk about what a value is as well. Um, so here's that part where interactively, this can just be writing it down or we can do drawing as well. So what are some of the values that are important to you? So it's fine for the child to pick something that's got, you know, it's listed on the Alaskan Native values that they agree with. And they might also come up with some really awesome things themselves or something that um, their family has taught them or a teacher has taught them as well. So they can share other values that are not necessarily on that list. Um, and they can do this at home with siblings or at school with their classmates. Um, this one um, talks about this owl and it introduces that placard idea. So when you go to a museum, there's these little placards and they give you the information, right? So um, here's Molly's, here's a, a, a native owl to Alaska and some very general information about the owl, nothing crazy. Um, and just tells you a little bit about what a placard is. And then they get to pick an animal that they're interested in. So um, it's really great to say, you know, like a local animal, right? I know in Boston, there's like a lot of geese, there's deer, there's all kinds of turkeys, wild turkeys. I'm from Florida. And when I saw wild turkeys in the streets in Boston, I was like, oh my God, that cannot be happening. But it was happening. So, um, you know, you some of you might have like rabbits and stuff outdoors. You know, there's lots of animals even in the city sort of running around. So they can pick one of those animals um, in their community or any animal they want and do a little bit of investigating, right? So you can like, okay, let's go learn about bunnies. And maybe we can even figure out the exact type of bunny that we have in our neighborhood. Um, so here are some questions to get them starting on like what to look up. Then they get to make, this is sort of like their presentation page. So if um, the way we've done this in person is um, we would print this page out and the student would like fill it out. And then they can either, you can see on the left here, they can either draw a picture, print out a picture, or the way that we did it in person was we made animal sculptures. So with uh, clay or with Play-Doh, we actually made the little animals and set it right there. So we had, say, in the classroom, one table that had each of these little things put down. You know, there were, if you have, a, a say, 10 students in the class and you've got 10 little spots around this table and everybody's little animal and paper is sitting there, and then you can go around the table and study the different animals that everybody learned about. Um, then it gets into a bio sketch. Um, so that's really learning about a person. So this is a great opportunity. Um, obviously here she's interviewed Mr. Patek um, and written a little bit about, about him. It's not very long, but it's very cute. And this is a wonderful opportunity um, for kids to learn about, um, but basically biographies and what a biography is. Um, so that tells you, you know, you can ask about um, birthdays, birthplace, important life events, special skills and talents, you know, those kind of things that are kind of important to people to identify who they are and their identity. Um, so they can pick somebody and this is a great time for um, kids to really think about, um, I would maybe suggest the elders in the family. Um, I know, you know, I really loved hearing my grandfather's stories. Um, about him growing up in Colombia and all these weird, he just had these weird stories about being in the mountains and doing things. And, uh, you know, I had him until I was late into my teens and, you know, I knew him well, but he passed away and I just never felt like, you know, you never quite get enough, right? So this is a great time um, to really interview people. And I think to learn even about your parents, your auntie, your uncle, um, your mentor, uh, just to connect a little bit here. So they can uh, pick somebody and interview them and put some stuff together. So here is the like final product, I guess, that they could make that you could, again, if you were in a classroom, you can put around the table. So the person's name, some interesting facts, um, some fun stuff about it. 
and then uh, draw a picture of the person or print out a picture or whatever seems right. Um, I will say that, again, think about also not just drawing, but creative things you can do. So for example, it could be um, a portrait of someone that you do using collage, right? So you can like cut out magazines and cut out the colors and do pasting. You can take paper and shred it and get like little shredded things and like glue it on and make the hair. So think about ways to incorporate other materials. So it's not always digital and it's not always writing. Um, so think about like, you know, using different things you have around the house. You know, you can even do like toilet paper rolls and cut them up and different things like that. Okay, so the other artifact that Molly introduces us to is a map. Uh, maps are really great things for kids to learn how to read. I know I have a horrible sense of direction. <laughs> I never know where I'm standing and if it wasn't for Google Maps, I, I just would be lost all the time. Like I literally don't know how to get anywhere. Um, so learning to read maps is extremely important to me in my life. So um, the example that Molly gives is um, because she lives um, in this beautiful um, area and there's a park, in the park, in the show, there are cameras set up in different places to watch the animals. So here's a map of all the places where the, the cameras are set up to watch the different animals. Um, so this is just drawn. Again, this is another opportunity where you can do gluing and cutting and using, you know, crazy, whatever materials you've got around the house as well. Um, here's some information about maps that you can use to teach the kids about the map and what it's for and, you know, what to include, like physical features, mountains, lakes, you know, buildings, bridges, things like that. Things to think about to include. Um, so then they get to pick a place in their community that they love to go to. So, um, and I would be, you know, very general, like they may not know the neighborhood as well as you do, but maybe they just want to do a map of the park, right? So maybe there's that park down the street that you take them to. So they can make like, here's the swing set and here's the slide, you know? Um, so they get to answer some questions like where they like to go, um, what they want to share about it. Why is this place important to me? Um, again, that could be anything. That could be a grocery store, just, um, <laughs> you know, any place they like and they can share about it. Um, so here's that uh, final presentation page. If you want to use it again, this, you know, this is just here to use if you want it, um, but they can say what the place is, some facts about it. And here again is an opportunity to make a drawing, take a picture. Um, you know, I think it's also okay, for example, to incorporate photography. So if you want to have them go to the park and take a picture on the cell phone, they can do that as well too, gluing, all that stuff. Again, just try to think about making each activity a little bit of a different one. So you're not drawing, you know, all for all five activities. It's nice to break it up. Um, the last one is a tradition. So um, for Molly, her tradition is this recipe um, for this, Nivagi ice cream recipe. And so she's kind of put that together and you can see the recipe right there. Um, I think that's also a really great opportunity to talk about the different things that people eat in different cultures. So I've been told that moose meat and moose fat are delicious. I've never tried it, but if I ever go to Alaska, I'm going to have to try it because Molly's suggesting it. Um, but it's a great thing to, to think about. And I think it's even a good lead in to talking about different cultures. You know, certain cultures don't eat certain meats and some, you know, eat other things and some people are vegan. So always think of how you can kind of learn about Alaska and learn about Molly's world and also learn about the rest of the world as well and how to incorporate. So these are great bridges into learning about other things as well. Um, so here, this tells you a little bit about tradition. It's an activity or a way to do something that you learn from elders, right? So here are some examples as well. Um, and also a great opportunity to talk about family traditions in general. Um, so here's that one that you would fill out. So they would pick a tradition, uh, what they learned about the tradition and why it's important. So this is really open. This could be a dance. This could be a recipe. Um, this could be, you know, the way they celebrate certain holidays. Um, I know my family being um, Colombian, they do Christmas completely differently. Um, and I always thought that was interesting. You, they like hide the gifts and you have to go find the gifts at midnight. It's totally different. So it can be any kind of tradition um, 
that they want to share. So because that can look different ways, um, there's a lot of freedom on how to do this one. So here's a sheet you can use, the name of the tradition and what it's about um, and what goes into it. Now it may look different, right? So here's another page. Maybe it's making, uh, you know, maybe the tradition is crocheting, right? And so you want to kind of draw or take pictures of the different steps. Maybe it's a dance and you're going to put the different steps here. So you don't, ha don't feel like you have to use all the pages. You kind of take from it what you need to put it together. And then at the end, once you've completed all the activities, you can get this really adorable um, certificate that you can um, present your student or your child with, um, you know, and congratulate them for making a museum, learning about Molly and also making their own museum as well. Um, and I think, I think this is extremely awesome um, in a school setting. Oh boy, just a second, I guess I closed the window. And um, here we go. We've got just a couple more slides. Okay, so um, the files that I'm going to be giving you, right? So I'm going to give you um, that whole booklet that we just went through, the whole museum one, the things that Gay talked about, right? So that PDF that talks about informational text, what it is, how to explain it, what we you know, the different kinds. Um, also that other one with Alaskan Native values. So there's information there that you might want to read and then, you know, break that down into pieces. Um, you're going to get the certificate also comes as a separate file. So you can just print that out if you have that uh, the ability. There is this beautiful map. It's a big file. Um, that's a map of Alaska, um, which you can print out is pretty big if you have a bigger printer. Um, if you're a teacher, you can maybe put it up in your classroom at some point when we have classrooms again. Um, but it's a really nice map and you can again just show it and look at it and read the little uh, tags and look around it. Um, the other thing that we're including is this book list. So this is, again, I want you to use Molly as really um, awesome. Well, one, she's awesome. So like definitely explore Molly and explore those Alaskan Native values and everything about Molly in that culture, which is amazing, but try to use sort of the way that um, Molly is set up to like use the informational text and explore, try to apply that those same tactics to other subjects. So um, this book list has really great books about nature, about people, about maps, about traditions that touch on very different kinds of things from around the world. So you can learn about other things as well. So for example, books about people, we've got The Life of George Washington. You've got Young Albert Einstein. You've got uh, the poet Monica Brown, right? So you've got a couple of different people to touch on. Some may be familiar to you, some may not. Under traditions, you've got a couple of different cultures as well. So here's um, one about Passover, so you can uh, study a little bit about Jewish culture. There's also um, dumpling, uh, moonbeams, dumplings, and dragon boats, right? So you can learn a little bit about Chinese culture as well. So these are just some other really great books that you can kind of look at, get some information about, and make kind of use them to create projects, right? So you can use those same kind of ideas. Like if you look at these books about nature, maybe you're picking a thunderbird and looking it up and finding more information about it in the book and then making a model or a drawing of it as well. Um, so there are some other like uh, points to jump off from. Um, so my hope for you is one that you really enjoy Molly. I, I honestly, I'm just gonna be really honest. I like Molly. <laughs> Once I started watching it, you know, I like kept watching it and my wife is like, are you still watching cartoons? I'm like, yes, it's Molly. I love her so much. So um, I think she's easy to get hooked on. I think she's a great role model. Um, but also I want you to make sure that you're incorporating um, these ideas at home and at school as well. So one thing I do want to point out is the other thing you want to teach kids is how to identify reliable sources of informational text, right? 
just because you Google something on the internet and some random blog shows up, it doesn't mean that that's accurate information, right? So thinking about cross-referencing, like don't just go with the first thing that you find on the internet, read a couple of different links and see if the information is consistent. Um, also think about the source of your information, right? Are you getting it from some random blog that seems to have like very shallow information or is it from an encyclopedia? Is it from a website that's totally dedicated to that subject? Is it coming, you know, where is that information coming from? Um, so it's something just really important for us to keep in mind when we're researching and for our kids to learn to do as well. Um, so make sure you're encouraging um, these kids to research informational text, but also to create informational text and um, continue to incorporate Alaskan Native uh, projects into um, whatever you're doing uh, or Alaskan Native values into your projects. Um, they, you know, help them explore social emotional learning and um, learning about relationships with ourselves, our communities, our families, our planet. Um, just kind of keep those core ideas at my, in, in mind. Okay, did you know that Alaska is the only state name that you can type on one row of the keyboard? I didn't know that, but that's cool. <laughs> okay, so um, what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and we can have um, Q&A. Um, Natalie, maybe you can un, um, or give people the ability to mute themselves. Um, I think what I'll do just before we start while Natalie's working on that, I just want to show you where to find the files. Um, so on the website, Techos Home backslash webinars. Um, the Molly webinar is happening today, so it's at the top, but once uh, after today, it'll be moved down a little bit further down. But here's where you can find the information. So here are the webinar slides. So this is this exact uh, presentation that we went over. So if you want to review all of the points that we made, you can click on that. That'll give you a PDF. And here's a link to a Google Drive folder. And when you open that, these are view only, which means you can download them yourself. So here are all the files that we talked about today. So here are the ones that, uh, the webinar slides, the two files that Gay referenced about the Alaskan Native values and the informational text. Here's the museum planner, the certificate, the map, and the book list. So you can just uh, right click on this and press download and download it to your computer, or you can open it from here as well. Um, and it should be pretty easy to access. If you have any trouble, you can email us at program at Tech Goes Home um, and we'll try to give you some assistance. So um, I'm just gonna open it up for questions. Um, we can do this a couple of ways. You can raise your hand, we can unmute you, um, you can type in the chat, um, any way you'd like to just get our attention. We're all ears. And I'll invite um, Gay and Melissa to unmute themselves and jump in because they know much more about Molly than I do. So I think I've seen more episodes, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Um, do you need to um, watch the TV program to connect with the activities or are they standalone? The activities are standalone. Um, Again, Molly is pretty engaging and she models how important it is to go to a reliable source of information to proceed with something. So it's often a nice setup. And like most PBS kids shows in a half hour, there's actually two episodes. So they're pretty short. There are maybe, you know, 12, 15 minutes. Um, but to answer your question more directly, they, you can do the activities separate from viewing. Yes. And the, um the app that you download, the gaming app. Mm -hmm. um, are there different skill levels for the games? And can you control that, the skill levels? Mm -hmm. that's, no, that's a good question. Um, we, so we, the, the answer other than that, that one, there's one game that we sort of designed for like sort of more of a four-year-old, like a, a lower skill level, but the others are generally meant to be for around like a five to six-year-old skill level. And we sort of determine that um, our process when we're making games is we go out and test them with kids. So we probably, you know, back when we could go into schools, we went to 
you know, Title I schools and after schools around Boston and Cambridge and everywhere um, around here. I'd probably tested with a couple hundred kids to try and do our best to, to create something that felt like, you know, for a five, six year old skill level, that was, you know, about the right amount of challenge. Um, so, so yeah, so that, so that's about where I would, would target it. I think because they, um, we do read, you know, everything back to you, um, they aren't really games that have, like, they're not like super gamey, twitchy, challenging mechanics. So I think we have seen younger kids enjoy them and be able to play through. That's always one of our goals that younger kids can play through. They may not just, they may not get quite as much out of it educationally, but from an appeal standpoint, I think you could still give it to like a four-year-old and they, you know, would get it. But from a curriculum, like learning standpoint, it's a little bit higher. Does that? Okay. What about um, children with learning disabilities? Have you tested this with them? So that, so that's, you know, so this project is part of Ready to Learn, which is a big Department of Ed Education grant. And part, there's definitely parts of that project that focuses on um, children with learning disabilities and, and designing games specifically for them. There was one that was designed for, um, I believe, Cyber Chase, that was like a very special project designed like for a child, like children who were blind. Um, and they sort of very carefully focused around that. For, for us, um, we didn't have sort of the scope to be able to you know, like adequately test what is a very wide, you know, wide ranging um, population and provide, you know, the specific supports that all those different kinds of learning disabilities would, would need. Um, I would say what we did aim for is something that's called universal design for learning, which is um, sort of an idea where we're trying to aim for things like, we're looking at things like text size and color contrast, and we're trying to make sure that there's not a lot of loud noises in the game. Like there are certain things we can do to try and make it more accessible broadly, but we just didn't have like the, the um, it wasn't part of like our budget and scope to really focus on those audiences in, in a way where we were really actually serving their specific needs. Thank you both, thank you. We did have a question in the chat, Melissa, which I think is for you. Um, somebody would like to know if there's access to the research about using the app. Um, yeah, can, um, I forget who asked that question. Is that Nancy? Can you say, yeah. um, was there something in particular that you're interested in? I'll keep my chat window open. Like every single game has a research and I would like to know if you have the, I can have the access or anybody can have the access just to make sure like um, how long it takes for a kid to adapt, what is the purpose of the um, game in the future and how you are like uh, projecting that. Interesting. So, um, so we did sort of our own informal research as we developed the games to sort of make sure that they were user friendly and that they were sort of teaching the curriculum goals, but it's that was sort of very it's like informal uh, research as we were developing them. There is a bigger research study in progress um, that is studying the whole Molly of Denali project and sort of looking at how all of the different things you've seen, the, 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 the games and the videos are increasing um, or not, hopefully they are, um, increasing knowledge of informational text, um, but that these big research studies take some time, so we don't have results from that yet to share. But our research partner, um, it's the kind of thing that they would publish out once we had sort of gone through um, the, full, the full study. Um, so I don't have specific information yet because those, um, that research study is still in progress. you know ex exactly when it's going to come up? You know, I, because it's with families and children and all that kind of research has gotten so challenging because of COVID, um, we had a timeline um, where I think it was going to be out early next year, but now I think it's very much up in the air um, because it's just much more challenging for all of us to really have access safely to the audience that we need to test with. So hopefully sometime next year, but it's, it's been slightly delayed because of COVID. 
Thank you so much, Melissa. I appreciate it. I don't know if Nessie wants to add something else. She was smiling during the time, so I, I don't know if she wants to add something. No, Melissa would know <laughs> better than me. <laughs> I, I just was smiling about um, the quality of your question. Is um, I like how interested you are in the research. So great. Do we have uh, more questions? Well, you've got us all here. No? All right. Well, we can wrap up. Um, if you think of a question later, you can always email us at program at Techos Home. Um, and I may not know the answer, but I can definitely forward it to Melissa or Gay to answer for you. Um, Natalie is putting in the chat right now a link. Um, we love to do surveys at after everything we do, uh, after all our courses, after our webinars, because we want to make sure we're giving you what you want and we're, um, you know, doing platforms as best possible. So if you could fill out that survey before you, um, you know, log off your computer for today, that would be great. Um, it's, it's right in the chat there. And again, I will send out an email, just a follow up email. If you miss, I know some of you came in late. Um, I'll have this recording. I can probably get up pretty soon since it doesn't really need editing. Uh, we don't have to blur anybody's personal information, <laughs> Gmail address out or anything. So I'll put it up as soon as I can and send that out as well so that you can watch it. And I'll send you in the email, a link uh, to the files. But again, it's, if you want to look at it right now, it's right on that webinar page as well. So, um, and I will send it to whatever email you use to register for this event. Um, okay. So I just want to thank Gay and Melissa so much. Um, uh, BGH is such a great partner and we're so happy to have um, you guys so uh, invested in Techos Home and so uh, collaborative with us. So thank you so much. Um, both of you, not just for today, but also all the work um, that you do with Techos Home. We really appreciate uh, you supporting our families. You guys are a great organization. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having okay. us. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and have a great afternoon. Go watch some Molly, go play some games. Um, you're going to get stuck in and you may not come back out. It's, it's very cute. Um, Thanks so well, everybody. Okay. Bye.